Portland seems to be in the throes of a bit of a crisis. I first moved to Oregon in the 1980s. And um, when I did, um, shortly after I came here, about a year or so after I arrived in Portland, Oregon, an Ethiopian student named Mulugeta Sarah, this was in 1987, um, was um, murdered. He was beaten to death by neo-Nazi skinheads associated with a group called East Side White Pride. They assaulted him on the street and beat him to death by kicking him and um, beating him with baseball bats. East Side White Pride was a neo-Nazi organization that had a strong um, relationship with another group, a national white supremacist group called the White Aaron Resistance that was led by a man named Tom Metzger, who was a national neo-Nazi activist and intellectual. At the time, the white nationalist movement or white supremacist movement, um, which has now more recently morphed into a white nationalist movement, um, targeted the Northwest in what they called the 10% solution. They said that because the Northwest was so white, approximately only 10% um, at the time of the population being made up of people of color, if you take the region as a whole, um, that uh, it would make a good white homeland. And so the KKK, for example, seeing the sunset on their ability to do successful organizing on a national scale, decided to deploy um, neo-Nazis and other white supremacists to the Northwest with resources in order to help establish organizations. And one of the fronts of their organizing was reaching out to young people, alienated young people, uh, particularly through the alternative music scene. What happened in the period of the 80s and 90s is that um, as awareness grew of the real threat that white supremacists, armed white supremacists, vigilante white supremacist groups posed, um, the federal government really started to crack down on them. Um, there was a tremendous amount of surveillance and repression. And um, in particular, um, the uh, federal government uh, targeted the Christian Patriot Movement. And the Christian Patriot Movement, was, which was a dangerous movement, reacted to that kind of repression by radicalizing further and growing even more dangerous. But resulting additional waves of repression forced um, the white supremacist movement um, underground. And so many of the people who are active here basically had to sort of make themselves scarce. But they've continued operating underground, um, including through um, you know, record sales and sales of material and showing up at things like expos and gun shows and um, you know, building um, cells um, uh, sort of you know, in the shadows. And um, so some of what we're seeing here now is the return of those people. The election of Trump has served as a kind of a green light an indication to them that the time is ripe for them to start to organize above ground again. And I think a certain amount of permission that's given when you have someone like Jeff Sessions as the head of the Justice Department, you know, somebody who was a notorious racist, is now the head of the agency that in the 80s we might have called upon if we couldn't get local police accountability around the issue of bias crimes. Portland has reacted um, by um, basically trying to um, rally itself together to um, make a really clear statement that this community is not a community that's going to support that kind of hate. Um, that in fact, the community is organized and is standing in opposition to it. Um, this Sunday, there will be a few rallies that are happening downtown. Well, one of them actually an alt-right rally that will be happening on a, a, in a federal park in downtown Portland and a couple of other rallies that have been organized that are um, meant to oppose their, um, you know, their message. Oregon is a bellwether when it comes to this kind of white nationalist, white supremacist, reactionary um, organizing. When um, the right asserts itself here, the country should brace itself. Um, because Oregon's particularly peculiar history um, makes us particularly vulnerable to this kind of thing happening, right? Oregon was founded as a whites-only state. The territory was settled in 1844 when it was, slavery was uh, banished here, you know, it was a ban here rather. And um, simultaneously, all black people in the state of Oregon were asked to leave. Um, if they chose to stay, they would be flogged. And um, so, you know, some people have characterized that as a progressive move, but in fact, the banning of slavery here in Oregon was a move to protect Oregon white settlers from competition from slave-rich capitalists. 
And um, so there's a kind of uh, egalitarian populist sentiment that is you know, involved in the founding of Oregon, but simultaneously um, a kind of racist sentiment having to do with the fear that um, white labor will be degraded through competition with black workers. Um, by the time Oregon was uh, founded as a state, um, whites only um, you know, exclusionary laws were put on the books and stayed on the books here until the 1920s. And that put in place a kind of historical set of dynamics that has caused Oregon to become a white flight state. So people came here from the Midwest when blacks went from field to factory, for example. There have been many waves of migration from California as California has become a majority minority state. People who come here say they want safety. They want to live in clean and safe communities. Um, you know, many of us hear that word safe and hear and um, read it as a code word for white. Um, Portland's, Portland is the lar whitest large city in the country. So, um, you know, those, uh, that creates the conditions under which populist movements here in Oregon basically stand but one foot in racial exclusion. And um, so, you know, we're a little bit like a European social democracy. We're known around the country as a progressive state, and particularly Portland is known as a progressive city. People, you say, keep Portland weird, you know, and um, really mean it. But um, Portland weird is truly weird around issues of race. Um, the statistics here also um, really tell a very, very different story about Oregon than, for example, um, the story that comes out of Portland having one of the largest um, rallies for Bernie Sanders in the country when he was running for president, right? Um, in fact, across almost every measure of racial equity, Oregon does worse than the rest of the country. Whites here make, for example, the same as um, white families do elsewhere, the same median family income, whereas black families make 17% less, whereas black um, children are 50%, have a 50% chance of being born into poverty nationally. Here in Oregon, their uh, chances are two out of three. So, you know, all of those things speak to this other part of, you know, the story of Oregon, um, which is that the incredible dominance of white people here, the overwhelmingly white, um, you know, sort of demographic, um, allows for us to understand ourselves as a progressive and liberal state, while also ignoring and marginalizing the needs of communities of color. And in fact, that progressive politic is in part contingent on that. 